very much for the opportunity to, to talk about a topic that I'm very interested in. Uh, I appreciate to be with all these great panelists as well, and uh, we'll get to it. Uh, Juan had asked me to talk about the extended retrosigmoid approach versus the endonasal approach. And this is a really good topic because I think these two approaches are really complementary. Um, and it's not one versus the other, but a lot of times they can work together. And I'll show you some examples of that as we go forward. Oops. First of all, I have nothing to disclose, um, not yet anyway. Uh, from our standpoint, these are the topics we're talking about. These are the tumors that uh, we're trying to address that are complex. They involve uh, parts of the posterior fossa um, uh, and extend down. And when it comes down to these topics what, what the and tumors, what the initial approach is uh, really kind of determines how this case is gonna go and uh, what, uh, what we need to accomplish with the uh, resections here. As one of my mentors in Pittsburgh like to say, a fool with a tool is still a fool. And even though we can do these things through different kinds of approaches, it's really under, uh, important to understand when to use them and when uh, your team is best uh, to use these kind of things. And so even though we talk about different ways to get there, the most important thing that we talk about is, is understanding your comfort level with these approaches and what you're trying to accomplish. When I'm looking at approaches and trying to figure out how to deal with these tumors, one of the things I like to tell my residents is the tumor determines how we get there, not necessarily what we have. And so based on what the tumor looks like uh, and what the tumor is doing really determines in how we approach these types of problems. And so when I'm thinking about approach, I'm looking at maximum symptom improvement. What are they presenting with? How do they come to me? Uh, and what can I help them with? Uh, obviously you wanna get as much tumor as you can safely uh, by minimizing uh, patient morbidity, but also improving the patient's experience through this process. A lot of times, and we've all been there, patient comes to you, they have a brain tumor, they're scared, they're nervous and appropriately so. And our job is to help manage those uh, expectations uh, with what we have to accomplish. And so beginning right off, I wanna know what the patient's presenting, whether they're presenting with hearing loss or visual decline or facial pain, all these things that uh, oftentimes bring patients to our, uh, our clinics. Uh, and then having a discussion with the patient to try to determine what does the patient want to accomplish? Now, obviously, a lot of times they come and they want it out, uh, but at the same time, uh, having a discussion what that really means uh, sometimes may change that goal. Um, understanding what the approaches your team is comfortable with. So if you're not comfortable with a contralateral transmaxillary approach, uh, pulling that out in a patient experience without practicing in the lab uh, can oftentimes lead to a disastrous results. Uh, and understanding what the risks are associated with it. So cranial nerve injury, vessel injury, uh, things like that that pop up. Reconstruction uh, considerations are very important. Uh, and is the patient prepared for a multiple stage approach or do they want it all over in one setting? A lot of times uh, those kind of things need to be weighed in and, and help us plan what happens next. And so the extended Richard sigmoid approach is a workhorse for neurosurgery. We've all done this before, um, where we try to uh, accomplish a wider opening exposure of the transverse sinuses. Is, uh, uh, and sigmoid sinus allows us to get more of an angle to accomplish our goals. Uh, a lot of times we remove the supramedial tubercle, which allows us to get higher uh, by cranial nerve three into, uh, into the Meckles cave further. Uh, oftentimes we do a partial mastoidectomy anterior to the sigmoid to allow us again to retract that sigmoid more out of the way uh, to get a better visualization of our target. Um, the combination of these things allows us to get access to the medial structures of the CPA and superior into the Meckles cave, which we talked about. Uh, and the risks are the risks of things that are around this area. So the risks of the vascular structures, the sigmoid sinus, the, uh, the vessels that are in that area, the cranial nerves, uh, as you get deeper, are going to be limitations um, and cause potential risks. And then other things, CSF leak, wound healing, and postoperative pain comes into effect with these as well. So important things to consider when you're talking about the retro sigmoid approach. Uh, at the same time, the endoscopic and nasal approach has uh, um, been used for approaching these kind of things. It can also be modified to uh, include um, uh, further reaches. So the contralateral transmaxillary approach, uh, transterygoid approach can obviously extend your reach laterally. And then finally, the, some of these uh, interesting ideas with a transconjunctival approach will get you more access as well. So modifying these approaches, just like if you modify the traditional approach, can get you more access. Again, the combination which approves you to uh, allows you to get to different areas uh, to access pathologies in these locations. 
Finally, the wrists are limited again by vascular structures. If you're coming from the front, you've got to deal with the carotids. Uh, a lot of times the basilar artery is going to be right in your way along with the perforating branches off that. Uh, CSF leak has been a historical problem with the ventral approaches to the uh, intradural pathology. And so knowing how you're going to address that uh, is an important aspect of things. But other things come up specifically, the things that Dr. Raza talked about and others. Uh, cranial nerve six is going to be uh, in play a lot of times when you do these more extensions laterally. Cranial nerve three comes into play if you're training a uh, trans um, uh, access to Meckles Cave, cranial nerve five becomes a risk. So all the same kind of things happen, only in a little bit different of order. Wound healing is an issue, cranial nerve injury, and then post-operative pain that may be associated with this as well. And so I like this slide a lot because it shows the residents uh, a lot of the traditional approaches for how we approach pathology in the posterior fossa. Um, and it really kind of highlights some of the bigger things that I'm worried about when I think about the approaches, specifically nerves and arteries. Those are essentially my defining lines about where and how I can get to different pathologies. And so uh, um, when it comes to the approach from the endoscopic and nasal approach, uh, you're really looking at the lateral aspects of uh, cranial nerve five, cranial nerve six, are really as far out as you can get uh, intradurally. Uh, Again, Dr. Raza talked about the bony anatomy, which is allows things to do a little bit better uh, resections from an endonasal perspective, but the nerves and the blood vessels are what limits us. Uh, same thing when it comes to the extended retro uh, sigmoid approach. So you're going to have to deal with the limitations of dealing with the sigmoid and the transverse uh, sinus. And then the lower cranial nerves are going to be uh, uh, ventral. And a lot of times you're going to be working between the lower cranial nerves and cranial nerve seven and eight uh, um, and five as you do these more midline approaches. So you can see that the two approaches are very much a complementary hybrid and can really work well with each other to attack uh, pretty complex pathology. This study here, again, uh, looking at the um, vantage point you can get with the uh, extended metal fossa and the bony anatomy uh, that you can see there and allows you to get a better viewing angle, especially for some of those deeper pathologies or more superior pathologies that may be ventral to uh, some of the lower cranial nerves. Another study looking at the bony stuff from the endonasal endoscopic perspective, a lot of this has been touched on before, but you can really tackle most of the clivus and uh, as you get inferiorly, you can actually extend your exposure more widely because you're below the level of the carotid, the carotid being the limiting factor as you get to that mid clival region. Um, but uh, as has been described earlier, we're finding ways to work around that. And so, Here's a, a pro section that we did uh, that really looks at some of the uh, anatomy here. I'll buzz through this fairly quickly. Uh, here you can see you can get ventrally pretty well, but really what happens is our lateral extension um, is limited because of the artery. Now, obviously this is a cadaver, so I can be a little bit more aggressive through this. Um, but as we look up and around, uh, you can start to see that um, because of the anatomy that's there, the endoscopic nose approach is really gonna be limited um, uh, as you look more laterally. Again, into the third ventricle, you can see the third nerve there, the tip of the basilar artery uh, into the third ventricle. Uh, and again, some of these lateral pathologies here dissecting out the third nerve further. And now really trying to look lateral to see what we can see. You see the sixth nerve inferiorly there, uh, dissecting the arachnoid plane, there's the sixth nerve. You can see five in the depths there. Uh, and even further out, you'll see uh, that you can see seven and eight. Unfortunately, uh, one of the risks of doing this is sometimes you can cause an injury to the sixth nerve, which is going to happen right here. Um, as we dissect further out, again, why getting out there is so difficult. Um, but eventually, you'll see there's seven and eight uh, down the depths. And so here is a patient that we did a, a resection of a, a clival chordoma. The carotids are exposed. We're expo removing the dura uh, because there was dural involvement here. And again, this is in real life. Uh, application of which you can see. Uh, you can resect more of this dural laterally. Here we're looking out to the side, exposure of the um, basilar artery there. Again, getting a good resection and good visualization to make sure there's no further intradural disease. There's cranial nerve six down there. And that's really the limiting factor when you come in from just this approach uh, is six uh, becomes a big uh, player in which you can and can't accomplish. Uh, here we are stimulating that. And so when we talk about the approaches, really the question is, is what approach to use, and that's what we've been harping on the whole time. And again, they're very complementary. Where the limitations of the extended retrosigmoid approach uh, is is really your where you're starting to get more into the the prime time, so to speak, for the endonasal approach, and vice versa. The things that are more difficult endonasally uh, are going to be easier from an extended retrosigmoid approach. Uh, and so, 
as we parked again earlier, and I think it's important, what are they presenting with? Uh, are they presenting with more visual complaints or facial numb tests uh, or, or brainstem compression from a gait? I tend to favor an endonasal approach for those kind of things, especially uh, depending on the anatomy and where the tumor is, uh, because I can uh, decompress and resect those, that tumor much more easily when it's more of a midline type uh, pathology. Uh, are they hearing more of a lateral uh, type problem where they're having hearing problems or facial nerve issues or swallowing? Uh, again, with brainstem compression, I tend to favor a more retrosigmoid approach. Again, every tumor is going to be different. I'm going to approach each one from a different perspective, depending on uh, what's going on and what my goals are to accomplish. Again, re-emphasizing here, the approaches are highly complementary, and many are, uh, times are used in combination with the staged approach, uh, which I'll describe a little bit later. And so here's another example. I think Dr. Gardner talked about this earlier. Uh, this is a trigeminal schwannoma, and there's a lot of ways to get to this uh, pathology. Certainly some people would approach this uh, um, retrosigmoid, although it would be tough because there's a large mechal cave component. Um, uh, middle fossa is a classic approach for this, which is a very, very good approach as well. But given the large amount that's in Meckel's cave, we actually decided to approach this endonasally um, because we were able to get the access between the carotid artery uh, and follow V2 back, which allowed us to get um, right to where we have to go. Here we have the carotid artery uh, exposed. You can see we're starting to get in the tumor uh, at this level here. Uh, and then we just switch back to our typical microsurgical dissections, uh, getting more exposure, working through this window using ultrasonic aspiration, um, uh, as well as uh, other techniques to help debulk this tumor. Eventually by taking out the inside, you make the tumor softer, you're able to dissect uh, the uh, nerves away from it, working in that corridor. Uh, eventually, we were able to get a pretty decent resection here, again, mobilizing the, in, uh, the component. Uh, eventually, we get all the way back to the, um, the uh, cisternal segment, and that allows us to make sure that we have the whole thing. We can drive the endoscope in there to look around when we're all done um, to get a good visualization, but this patient did very well. So even though this tumor is lateral to the carotid artery, we're able to work in it because it's in Meckel's cave. Now, if it had a larger posterior fossa component, I don't think I would have been able to approach it that way because as you get further back, working through the narrow corridor, it's really hard to see. And as you start to extend that approach up and down, you start to run into the vessels uh, and nerves of the uh, um, superior, um, uh, superior, the, um, uh, superior orbital fissure, sorry. Um, and so here you can see the post-operative uh, uh, pictures. We got a good resection and she did fairly well uh, uh, with this approach. Uh, again, a young woman who uh, preferred to have it done uh, through a minimal access approach if possible. Here's another tumor. So this is a tumor in a, a patient who presented with hearing loss uh, and severe gait uh, instability. It's a tumor that goes fairly wide um, up to the tentorum. You can see there down to the lower cranial nerves. And so a pretty large tumor with the guys uh, significantly symptomatic. Uh, from our uh, approach for this, we decided to take them for an extended retrosigmoid approach for this uh, lesion uh, with the goal of uh, decompressing as much as we could safely. Here we left them on the brainstem. I could not get that off. And you can see we're up to the basilar artery here. But what we noticed with this approach is that over time, uh, as the tumor condensed, it actually allows us to get a, a much more manageable approach uh, down the road. So now this is a patient we could consider going through an endoscopic and endonasal approach to, uh, to uh, finish the rest of the tumor versus debulk it um, uh, as we go forward. And here's a good example of that. This is a patient who uh, presented initially with a six nerve palsy. Um, uh, we ended up taking her first for endonasal approach uh, and then doing a retrosigmoid to complete the job uh, with a really good resection. She still has some tumor left in her cavernous sinus. Uh, which we'll keep an eye on. And from my perspective, uh, I'll keep it short and sweet. Uh, once again, thank you guys for the opportunity to discuss some interesting cases. Uh, thank you to my mentors who taught me how to do these kind of things and uh, help us to learn the anatomy, which allows us to proceed with further surgical resection and to essentially get better. So thanks again, Juan and Paul. I appreciate it. And um, I'll turn it back over to you.